car and driver. This is Lightning Lap. For the 17th year, we return to Virginia International Raceway, where our team of professional test drivers run the latest and most exciting performance vehicles around the 4.1 miles and 24 turns that make the Grand Course. Think of it like an American Nurburgring. Each vehicle is configured in its highest performing or track ready setup, and the only modifications permitted are things like durability enhancing brake fluid, which we see as more of a safety modification. There were exceptions this year, of course, three of them. But we'll get to those later. We categorize vehicles based on price and order them here from slowest to quickest. You can watch each vehicle's individual lap on its corresponding page in the links below. Remember though that a lap time is just that. So we also aim to explore the overall picture of a vehicle's character. The Honda Civic Si has always been an incredible low-buck enthusiast car. And though this 11th generation version is more agreeable all around, as we learned during our 40,000 mile long-term test, a few of its changes slowed it down versus the Si Coupe we tested in 2017. That coupe no longer exists. And this Si sedan is not only bigger and heavier, but it's slightly less powerful too. The sweet shifting six-speed manual carries over, but it has a shorter final drive ratio that's doubtless a boon at the autocross, but not ideal for the wide open spaces of VIR. In corners where the old SI could dip into second, this SI had to stay in third. Add the extra mass and the result is a slightly slower approach to the climbing S's and a slower top speed down the back straight. Still, the SI remains well coordinated through the medium speed direction changes, despite the Goodyear Eagle F1s that are now out of production. As of now, Honda does not offer factory fitment summer tires. Nevertheless, the SI carries so much more speed through the second part of Hogpen that it can get a higher top speed at the finish line. The Honda Civic SI is still a great driver's car, but it's probably better suited to a tighter racetrack or an autocross course more than it is VIR. The 10 best winning Subaru BRZ and Toyota GR86 were fantastic at lightning lap 15, but the fun usually ended after a lap when the brake pedal turned mushy. With the BRZ TS unavailable at the time of this year's test, we brought down the BRZ we're currently running through our 40,000 mile long-term test, and with it, we tried creating a cost-effective track day upgrade package. It only takes a handful of hot laps to find the upgrades are transformational. The setup dropped the lap time by 3.1 seconds, and it didn't alter the playful handling balance. Similarly, the brakes withstood multiple hot laps at a time during roughly 19-minute sessions. They delivered consistent stopping power, pedal feel softened only a touch. We also put on a couple thousand street miles and found the setup livable, though obviously you want to remove the pads and tires once track day season ends. The pads squeal terribly outside of their operating temperature range, and the tires don't like cold weather. If you're set on taking your BRZ or GR86 to the track, consider our setup as a good starting point to improve lap times and reduce your anxiety level every time you mash the middle pedal. Quick laps are as much about driver confidence as they are a vehicle's capabilities, and ours shattered after the EV6 GT had huge turn and oversteer in the middle of the climbing S's on our first outlap. After that, we no longer dared keeping the stability control off. The EV6 wanted to go rear first everywhere. 
it would carry drifts through multiple corners, including in a terror-filled moment, the back end stepping out through the kink on the front straight at 130 plus miles per hour. Each hot lap used roughly 20% of the battery, but the EV6 never cut power and its superior straight line acceleration allowed it to keep pace with the much better driving BMW i4 M50 from last year. Despite having a power to weight ratio fractionally better than the latest M2, the EV6's G average through turn one was the second worst of this year's group. And while the brakes never went away, braking over curbing sometimes caused the ABS to jump in too strongly. The EV6 GT is simply not a track car, and that's okay. We now fully understand why Hyundai would choose to take a couple additional years to develop its version of this car, the 2025 Ionic 5N. Simply, the changes that make the Acura Integra Type S a better daily than the Civic Type R hold it back on the racetrack. Of course, that shouldn't be too surprising. The lack of a track mode for stability control was unfortunate, though there is a process to disable the system entirely. It's called a pedal dance for reasons that become obvious after doing it. Then there's the bucket seats that aren't as deeply contoured and the adaptive dampers that have a bit less rebound. But there's one big difference, tires. The best available for the Type S is the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S. A fine tire, but a far cry from the Pilot Sport Cup 2s on the Type R that we lapped here previously. This slowed the Integra considerably. Slower exits onto straights lead to slower peak velocities, so a cornering deficit earns you compound interest. The Integra Type S is still highly enjoyable. It dances through the tight stuff and the engine pulls hard out of corners. The brakes are powerful and supremely heat resistant and the dual axis strut suspension can make you forget it's front wheel drive. Would a set of tires make all the difference? Well, if Acura won't offer them, there's nothing stopping you from hitting up Tire Rack. Pull up to a track day in an X5M and most will assume it's your tow vehicle. But BMW's most ferocious X5 can earn more than a few surprise point buys. The latest X5M is 130 pounds heavier than before, in part from a revised engine that adds a 48 volt hybrid system. Yet it was slightly quicker through the uphill S's than this year's M2 and Z Nismo, and it hung right with those two in the back half of the infield and while sliding through Hogpen onto the front straight. We ran 2.4 seconds quicker than the last X5M we tested here, making this the third quickest SUV we've run. That's behind only the Cayenne Turbo GT and Lamborghini Urus, both of which had far racier tires. The lap time's also fractionally quicker than a C6 Corvette Z06 and a current 718 Cayman S. The X5M is amazingly balanced and competent. It loves to rotate and claw through corners neutrally, and it devours curbs. The brakes held up phenomenally too. In fact, it took a while for us to build up to braking so late in something this big and heavy and with this high of a vantage point. Simply, X5M owners who don't explore this SUV's capabilities, they're missing out. With 453 of the most well-muscled horses this side of the Bavarian Alps, our first laps in the M2 felt like driving on a slip and slide. The power slides were easy to catch and modulate, but they kill lap time. Just how powerful is this M2? Enough to make up for its moderate grip. It was slower through turn one than the previous generation M2 competition, but exited most corners going a touch faster. On the front straight, it was 4.9 miles an hour faster than the M2 competition. That kind of power requires patience on corner exit, and once we got the tail to behave, this M2 went 2.8 seconds quicker than that M2 competition beating it through four of the track's five sectors. Sharp, precise steering helped place the M2, though its muted feedback masked what the front tires were doing. And there's surely more time in it, too. Our car lacked the optional lightweight carbon fiber roof and bucket seats, and it carried the added weight of a sunroof. Still, the M2 proved it can slither around all you want, but tame those wild horses, and it'll lay down some impressively quick, tidy laps.
approached the Nissan Z Nismo with caution, remembering very well the 2009 370Z Nismo's brake failure that sent one of our drivers into the wall at turn one. But as the laps piled on, our confidence grew and the braking zones shortened. The brake pedal stayed positively firm after three days of lapping, though the front rotors were grooved enough to look like an LP made of chrome. The Z Nismo is a joy on track. The twin turbo V6 asks for patience when exiting the slower turns, but respect the torque and the tires getting the power to the ground. Even the nine speed automatic, the sole transmission option, it had crisp shifts. The steering even shows signs of life, especially under full load in hog pen, where the duress of the front tires is fed back through the thin rimmed wheel. While most other cars at this level have adaptive dampers, the Nismo has passive units. Still, this Z gets around VIR unfazed by various grades of curving. Well, mostly unfazed. That one was our fault. Our only concern is the rear differential, whose fluid approached 400 degrees, or enough to push the fluid out of the vent tube and coat the exhaust, leading to a very unpleasant smell. If you plan to track the Nismo, investigate some cooling options. At just 43 pounds lighter than the supercharged Shelby GT500, it sure seems like the Ford Mustang Dark Horse has spent too much time grazing. But hey, you wouldn't call a sumo wrestler fat. Some of the heft is from the 15.4 inch two-piece rotors up front and the 14 inchers in the rear. And this brake package is the real deal, hauling this 500 horsepower Mustang down from 145.9 miles per hour before turn one. That's two miles per hour faster than the 349 pound lighter Z Nismo, yet the Mustang got to the brakes roughly 60 feet shorter. Shortening the brake zone by roughly 10% is significant. As we saw during our 0 to 150 to 0 test, the Pirelli P0 Trofeo RS tires do a fantastic job applying braking forces to the tarmac. But when it comes to lateral Gs, the Dark Horse doesn't match the Mustang Mach 1 we tested in 2021. Cornering grip is down everywhere versus that car, but carrying around an additional 213 pounds will do that. On the upside, the Pirelli's offered consistent grip lap after lap. The bigger letdown is the 10-speed automatic, which doesn't take many laps before warning you of rising fluid temps. And with the heat comes indecisiveness and untimely downshifts. It's very likely the six-speed manual might knock a little time off, but nevertheless, the Dark Horse's lap is good enough to dethrone the Mach 1 as the Mustang King. With 40 more horsepower, specific chassis tuning, and a nearly $30,000 higher price, the M3 CS easily outpaced the M3 competition we tested here two years ago. Problem is, the three and a half second difference should have been much bigger. In fact, we thought it might be closer to the M4 CSL we tested last year, as it's essentially a continuation of that model, but with two more doors, a back seat, and all wheel drive. Sadly, a tire snafu ruined its chances. There are four available tire models for the CS, two Michelins and two Pirellis. Our CS showed up on the Pirelli PZ4s and with a backup set of Michelin Cup 2s. We used the PZ4s to sort the car and planned to switch to the Michelins for the fast lap only to find the fronts were the wrong size. And in the frenzy to get a new pair overnight, we wound up with Cup 2Rs which aren't available on the CS. That means the lap time on the Pirellis doesn't fully represent the CS's impressive capabilities. We hope to have it back next year on the correct tire. The E-Ray is no stranger to VIR. During its development, Chevy engineers brought it here several times to learn how to extract the quickest lap time. We were glad they were on site to share that knowledge. The 1.1 kilowatt hour battery can't provide full boost for the entire lap, and the power from the electric motor driving the front wheels trails off after 120 miles per hour. The solution? 
the driver has to parse out the electrical energy over a lap using the car's charge plus mode, which allows the battery to deploy some of its juice while holding some in reserve. Luckily, the 8-speed automatic shifts smartly on its own, which allows you to focus on fumbling with the awkward charge plus button on the side of the center console. That annoyance aside, the E-Ray's track performance confirmed its middle position in the C8 lineup, with a lap time between the Stingray Z51 and the Z06. The E-Ray felt slightly bigger and less precise than the lighter Stingray, but still well balanced, with virtually no high-speed understeer. It muscled through the slow turn one, and its all-wheel drive system yanked it out of that corner 0.6 miles per hour faster than the Z06. The carbon ceramic stoppers felt like they could arrest a runaway train, but the propulsion system's limitations showed on the front straight, where the E-Ray topped out 2.4 miles per hour slower than the less powerful Stingray. That speed deficit in no way diminishes the E-Ray's prowess. It's a big bruiser that can dance in a multi-talented middle child of the C8 family. Considering the Lucid Air Sapphire's four-digit peak horsepower figure and 5,300 pound weight, we admit to suppressing some intimidation on our first lap. It wasn't warranted. The Sapphire is so approachable that our tentative first lap was already five seconds quicker than the existing EV record, and that was in the 767 horsepower endurance mode, one of the three sub-choices for track mode that allows for longer sessions. Hot lap mode has 1,003 horsepower, and that meant the fourth highest speed on the front straight that we've ever recorded. There's no getting around physics, so stopping for turn one required anticipating braking markers that don't exist. The speed is remarkable, but the Sapphire is about way more. When you get it right, it can really flow through the back half of the infield, with the rear end just perfectly settling as the next curbing comes into view. Consider that its second time equaled the 911 GT3 Manti through the uphill S's and the slow spiral corner in the infield. It's amazing what's going on behind the scenes to make the Sapphire drive naturally. There is no limited slip differential in back, so it's all software tuning. Powering out of turn one, it can be overdriving the outside tire while dragging the inside motor with slight regenerative braking. Add in the subtle aero tweaks and the sum is a car that feels totally stable at big speeds, including steering through the kink on the front straight at 160 miles per hour. How might the Tesla Model S Plaid compare? We haven't been able to source one with a track pack for Lightning Lap, but a pro driver ran a 2 minute 50.7 second lap in a Plaid at one of our track days. That makes this result a monumentally impressive first outing for Lucid. The Sapphire isn't just the fastest EV, it's also the fastest four-door. On the all-time leaderboard, it's nestled between the 2016 Viper ACR and 2020 Mustang Shelby GT500. Good company. Porsche owns a majority stake in Manti Racing and has designated it its motorsports partner. What that means to well-to-do Porsche owners is aftermarket parts that carry a factory warranty, and thus the GT3 Manti Racing's entry into Lightning Lap. We do mean well-to-do, as the GT3 package costs about as much as a new 718 Boxster, consisting of suspension, brake, wheel, and aerodynamic changes. These changes make small gains versus the GT3 we ran in 2021. The added downforce helps in corners, but hurts on the straights. After exiting hog pen 0.4 miles per hour more quickly than the stock GT3, the Manti Racing version has a 0.5 miles per hour lower top speed. This GT3 shines in linking the corners climbing the hill towards roller coaster, gaining a lead over the stock GT3 it never gives back. One big advantage that seems tiny on paper is that the new dampers allow for an extra half degree of negative camber, resulting in crisper turn-in. 
The steering rack hasn't changed, but on-center feel is tighter, leading to confidence in fast corners, where it's as if an already planted car just put down additional roots. The lap time amounts to a 8 tenth of a second lead over the regular GT3, and that may not seem like much, but for a modification package that doesn't change the engine output or tire compound, it's a lot. If you're in the business of winning track days, the GT3 RS will send your stock skyward. What's arguably Porsche's most extreme road-going model ever has active aerodynamics and seemingly endless supply of settings. You could spend all day tinkering with the four knobs that control all the settings. Fortunately, Porsche Pro Patrick Long was on hand with a recommendation. Maximum rebound front and rear and a bit of extra diff lock when coasting. We don't have a historical braking stat from VIR, but if we did, the GT3 RS would likely be the king of it. While the GT3 RS hit 157.3 miles per hour at the end of the front straight, it feels even faster because you can brake well past the number five marker. If you're too early on the stoppers and need to modulate, the hydraulics translate tire communication so cleverly that it's as if you woke up to discover you could speak a new language. Fun is everywhere, but finding time on track took longer than normal because of this GT3's cornering speed capability. Pick a speed, decide on a spot to go flat, and you're wrong. Faster and earlier is always the answer. We haven't even mentioned the glorious 9,000 RPM 4 liter flat six. Its sounds and vibrations make every lap a hair-raising event. And while the engine is one of the greatest of all time, the GT3 RS's true magic lies in how it makes something as light as air have seriously heavy impact. In addition to lap time, we log 24 on-track data points. Remarkably, this GT3 RS tops our all-time charts in 12 of them. Here's its full lap with a few of those highlights.
Lightning Lap is limited to stock cars driven by our team of test drivers, but this year had a few exceptions. Not one, but three professionals showed up ready to challenge the Grand Course, a configuration of VIR that none of them had tried before. For years, we've wondered where a sport bike would land on the Lightning Lap leaderboard. This year, we found out. BMW racer and test rider Nate Kern showed up with the 205 horsepower BMW M1000RR that was fitted with race slicks in an aftermarket exhaust system. As he explains it, the onboard electronics and gyroscopic sensors, along with adjustable settings for throttle response, engine control, and traction and wheelie control, give him incredible confidence. Consider that heat short shifts into six gear before the kink on the front straight to minimize wheel spin. Yeah. It breaks traction above 165 miles per hour. And Nate left a tire mark in the same spot on every fast lap. The resulting lap time was only two tenths behind the $216,000 Porsche 911 Turbo S we ran in 2021, and comparing the laps illustrates just how quickly the BMW accelerates. On the front straight, it has a five miles per hour advantage. On the back straight, 10 and a half miles per hour. But the higher speeds and the fact that the bike sends most of the stopping force through a single tire is a recipe for longer braking zones, seeding that gain back to the 911 Turbo. Kern exits spiral at 93.7 miles per hour, the fastest we've ever recorded, but the Turbo S pulls ahead in the tight, twisty back half of the infield and maintains the small gap. Running this kind of time for under 40 grand is impressive, to say the least. And if you're looking to improve your skill set, check out Kern Track Days. We'll probably stick to sitting on leather instead of wearing it. The full name is NASCAR Next Gen Garage 56 Chevrolet Camaro ZL1, or G56 Camaro for short. Yes, this is the development twin to the same car that raced at Le Mans this past year. It's all natural 5.8 liter V8 winning the hearts of the crowd and showcasing the uniquely American motorsport discipline on the world's biggest stage. Hendrick Motorsports manufactured and managed the project. We never really thought they would agree to bring the car out, but they did. Driver Jordan Taylor didn't race in France, but the 10-year IMSA vet did a lot of the development. While he calls VIR one of its favorite tracks in the world, he's never lapped the grand configuration on anything other than a simulator. On track, the G56 is simply rad in the most American way. It's loud, it's fast, and it's big, almost as wide as a pickup and some 10 inches longer than a Corvette. Taylor locked the rears going into turn one, hence the low 1.19 Gs of lateral acceleration there. The rest of his lap was clean, particularly when he was on the full course where he's most familiar. He sends the G56 through the climbing S's at an average of 158 miles per hour. That's more than 20 miles per hour than any other streetcar we've lapped here, and nearly six miles per hour faster than the Subaru Air Slayer. The Camaro also trumps the Subaru in the difficult turn three, off camber turn 10 and in hog pen. Given another shot, we bet this Camaro could match the Subaru's faster lap. We also hope the effort to make a stock car run fast for 24 hours doesn't stop. An all NASCAR endurance race might be more fun than the 24 hour race in France. You probably remember seeing the Subaru Air Slayer flying over a speedboat in Gymkhana 2020. When the Subaru team showed up at VIR with racing vet Scott Speed, they had another target to clear, the track record. Built by Subaru Motorsports partner Vermont Sports Car, the Air Slayer is essentially an uncorked WRX STI rallycross car. Sands the engine restrictor required by regulations, the custom 2.3 liter flat four makes 862 horsepower. Not only that, it runs on fuel so corrosive it'll eat through your shoes. 
Seeing the aerodynamics, the radiator sitting in the back seat like a kid's car seat, the flames shooting out of the hood, you get a real no rules can am vibe. The Air Slayer is fast everywhere, obviously, sticking at 1.32 G's in turn one, for example. But it's more shocking how it accelerates. It exits Hogpen at 125.9 miles per hour, and the next closest streetcar in lightning lap history is the McLaren Senna at 121.6 miles per hour. The Corvette Z06 is doing 114. With Scott's speed at the wheel, the Air Slayer lapped VIR in two minutes, 25.6 seconds, putting it 1.1 seconds ahead of the Garage 56 Camaro. The advantage was almost entirely generated after turning off the back straight. In the tighter and more technical part of the track, the Air Slayer takes full advantage of its rally routes, including some lines that would raise Stewart's brow. Whatever car eventually beats its time should wear the moniker Speed Slayer. <laughs>